Margaret Thatcher was elected to office with a mandate to curb union power. In doing so, Mrs Thatcher would provoke anger and outrage, most notably during her second term in office, when confrontation first with the miners and later with the print unions would give way to scenes of violence and civil disorder little seen in peacetime Britain. The unions would never be the same. But how did reform turn into conflict and all-out war? Mrs Thatcher's attitude to the trade unions had been hardened by Edward Heath's battle with the coal miners that resulted in his election defeat in 1974. Then, as leader of the opposition, she witnessed the failure of the Labour government to influence the unions, leading to further strikes and the winter of discontent. What sort of government is it which sees its authority passed to strike committees? You will perhaps have noticed the speed and efficiency with which some of those pickets went into action. They seem to know somehow exactly which factories to go to, to cause maximum dislocation. Determined to avoid a repeat the following year, Mrs Thatcher set about sorting out the unions. Over five years, three bills containing union legislation were introduced by three different employment ministers, Jim Pryor, Norman Tebbit and Tom King. To be Secretary of State for Employment under Mrs Thatcher was to be under constant pressure, rather like a racehorse. Uh, she wanted to go faster than they, and that was Jim Pryor and Norman Tebbit, thought was wise. And I think the success of the government's trade union approach was a combination of this fierce jockey and the astute horses that were riding the policy. Uh, but she always wanted to go faster than they did. While Mrs Thatcher was driving forward her policy for union law reform, the seeds for the miners' strike were being sown with the election of left-winger Arthur Scargill as president of the National Union of Mine Workers in December 1981. We want leadership in this union. We don't want leaders who come out of negotiations halfway through and say to the waiting press, I don't believe there's any more available before we've had a chance to go back in. I think Scargill was somebody who was um, probably a genuinely sincere Marxist. I, when I read all of his past lectures and all of his past speeches, there was this enormous consistency that you know, the world was going to be a better place when the Marxist revolution took place. And, for example, he campaigned for unions not to accept for their workers profit-sharing because he said profit sharing will make the workers like capitalism. And we don't want the workers to start to like capitalism. We'll never defeat capitalism if they like capitalism. And things like that, which were you know, passionately believed. Earlier in 1981, before Scargill's election, a miners' strike over possible pit closures and redundancies had been averted by what was portrayed as a government climb down and a victory for the miners. She decided basically to give in to the miners in the beginning of 1981 for their demands. They were trying to resist uh, closures. It was a big closure program. And Mrs. Thatcher, of course, wanted the closure program because the coal mines were costing absolutely ludicrous amount to the Exchequer. But she gave in. And the reason she gave in is she wasn't ready. The trade union laws weren't ready, nor were the coal stocks ready, nor were the probably the state of the police. And um, she knew that she had to do that, uh, and then she was ready next time round. Although pit closures had been temporarily shelved, it was apparent that the national coal industry was in decline and collieries would have to close. It was also clear to Mrs Thatcher that Arthur Scargill would mount a challenge to the government. I, mean, I was asked to do the job at Energy because of the emerging Scargill position. I mean, Margaret Thatcher phoned me and said, Peter, I want you to go to Energy um, because, as you know, Mr. Scargill will undoubtedly try and get a strike. 
because he had tried on about eight occasions in the last parliament and had never obtained it because the miners' union had never had a strike without a ballot. And every time he was defeated in the miners' ballot. And she said, I'm sure you will keep on trying. And if he does, it will be a very serious part of this life of this government. She left North London bound for a triumphant reception at Conservative Party headquarters. Mrs Thatcher did not have to wait long. After her victory in June 1983, the sabre rattling began. Arthur Scargill was quick to condemn the result as the worst national disaster for a hundred years. Margaret Thatcher's first visit to any government department after a re-election as Prime Minister was the Department of Energy to try to find out how to live with Arthur Scargill. She knew what was coming. And if it had been a Labour government that had been elected in 1979, the Prime Minister of the time would have, should have gone to the Department of Energy and said, how do I live with Arthur Scargill? Because he was quite impartial in his contempt for government. He was an old-fashioned uh, revolutionary, really, and he was determined to get rid of the government uh, to the greater glory, as he saw it, of the miners, who would have a job for life until the last not of curl had been removed from a pit, regardless of whether it was economic or not. But Mrs Thatcher was now not just confident of her cause, she was confident of support in the country. She had already brought in Ian McGregor to head up the National Coal Board. It was his job to draw up plans to save money, close pits and scrap jobs. He had been a brilliantly successful American industrialist and he had settled a number of big strikes there. And he was put in, first of all, to steal and he was chairman of the steel board, and there was a strike, and it was settled you know, after a few months. Um, and so I think he felt that, you know, against Scargill, he'd have a tough in American industrialist who would deal with it. During the second half of 1983, relations between management and union deteriorated. In October, the NUM agreed a ban on overtime in protest at the coal board's latest pay offer and at prospective pit closures. We have ask them to reconsider their position because it seems to me to be a very belligerent attitude on the part of the board and its chairman to terminate at this stage negotiations after any purpose um, which could have been served by developing the matters that we've put on the table today uh, was not pursued. Our sales are the controlling factor in this business. We just can't continue to produce coal and stack it up in order to please all of the people who want to continue to produce coal without a market. In December, McGregor brought forward plans to cut the workforce by 20,000 and close around 20 pits. Discussions were held with the NUM, but it was immediately clear they were unlikely to succeed. I think it's confirmation that Mr McGregor intends to butcher this industry in the same way that he did with British Steel and British Leyland. There can be no doubt that his declared intention today to reduce the output level by some 8 million tonnes means the closure of, of between 20 and 40 pits and the possible loss of between 20 and 40,000 jobs. It was now clear that a strike was inevitable. But the government expected that Scargill would hold a national strike ballot first and there were hopes that most miners would be bought off by the cash being offered. Arthur Scargill, however, used the union rule book to avoid it. The biggest regret I've got is that I didn't follow, follow my instincts around about Easter time in 1984 and call publicly and directly for a ballot of NUM members in order to determine whether there should be a strike or not. The great mistake of um, Neil Kinnock, who had by now become leader of the Labour Party in succession to Michael Foote, was that he never denounced the lack of a ballot. He wanted to, I think. There were moments when he came near to saying you shouldn't go on strike without a ballot. He never actually said it. I thought that the change in NUM rules that Arthur Scargill had, in my view, rightly secured, meant inevitably that those new rules, perfectly democratic rules, were to be used for the purpose of holding a strike ballot. And I was utterly wrong about that. I wasn't alone. There were many leaders of the uh, regional uh, miners' union, um, the parts of the NUM, who made exactly the same assumption. And they were taken as much by surprise as I was. And in the circumstances, I suppose I allowed 
sentiment, sympathy, commitment to the essential rightness of the miner's cause and the case for coal to uh, persuade me not to make the public call. The strike began on Monday the 12th of March, 1984, with about half of the country's pits being stopped. But it was the tactic of using flying pickets that really alarmed the government. Scargill had the total support of his Yorkshire miners, and by using them as his shock troops, the plan appeared to be to scare other regions into joining the strike. Some of the men were determined to go to work despite the pickets. While outwardly maintaining the dispute was between management and union, the government became directly involved when Mrs Thatcher gave authority for the police to mobilise, almost as an army. 3,000 police officers from 17 forces were involved. Some people accused her of, trying, of creating a national police force to, to deal with this. I don't think that is true, but what is certainly true is that there was more coordination than there used to be and there was more central purpose. At this early stage, the picketing was centred on Nottinghamshire, but the flying pickets failed to stop a vote among the local miners that showed a majority against strike action. Other area ballots also voted to work. In that first week, the combined force of the police and ballot reversed the trend towards shutdown of the pits. In Mrs Thatcher's view, the first crucial battle had been won. If there'd been a national ballot, the Nottinghamshire coal miners would have done what they did in the 72 and 74 strikes, and they would have been loyal to the union. Because there wasn't a ballot, they resisted. And Arthur Scargill uh, organised the flying pickets, to try and stop men going into work in those circumstances. Even if people sympathized with the cause, they said, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to work. Men from nine forces converged on the steel plant, which earlier Arthur Scargill had vowed would be sealed off by the pickets. In May, as the strike moved into a third month, allegations of heavy-handed tactics and police brutality were being leveled at Mrs Thatcher. One flashpoint was Orgreave coking plant near Sheffield, where police used riot gear for the first time since the strike began. Then the riot squads, the helmeted policemen with their plastic shields, were deployed after smoke bombs were thrown. The violence continued, and at one stage the pickets nearly broke through the police barricade. The police had you know, responsibility for keeping law and order. So if they discovered that Scargill was sending a thousand um, militant pickets to a place, they had to be there to keep law and order. And they soon found they couldn't do it from each constabulary. They had to have a force that they could move around the country, but they organised that themselves under no political instructions at all. Most of the police leadership knew they had a big civil disorder on their hands, and the way to deal with that was in a civil fashion. And they did. It could be much, much worse if they didn't. And if they weren't their counterparts, in the regional leadership of the miners' union, who took the same mature, sensible course. But that wasn't universal on either side. More arrests followed, and the injuries, pickets as well as policemen. On a second day of rioting, Arthur Scargill managed to get himself arrested. 1984, Great Britain. Remove the rest of them. Get them moving. The pitched battles continued into June. We were hoping, after yesterday, that there would be uh, a different sort of picketed. But quite obviously that's not the case. There are more here than I've seen before. Uh, it started off with the pushing, but then of course you saw the missiles coming over. When them lads got injured, our lads backed off. We all backed off. And they kept, and they shoving. kept shoving. They kept they shoving. Kept shoving. We were trying to get our lads out what were injured. We don't want anybody injured. Nobody. We don't even want police injured as far as that's concerned. But when they face them in, that's when we get upset. Scenes of conflict only served to strengthen the Iron Lady's determination that violence could not be allowed or seen to succeed, as she made clear to an audience of Tory supporters in Port Call in Wales later in June. Mr Chairman, what we have seen in the past few weeks is not picketing at all. It is an attempt by force to prevent others from doing what they have a right to do. It is intimidation. It is unlawful assembly. Our duty demands and the national interest requires that we see that violence does not pay and is seen not to pay. Yeah. But the strike and violence dragged on through the summer and all attempts at negotiation failed. 
Arrests had been made and convictions secured, but despite the new powers contained in Mrs. Thatcher's union reforms, the Coal Board didn't try to get injunctions against the NUM and sequester their funds. Energy Secretary Peter Walker didn't believe it would help end the dispute. I'd tell you exactly what would happen. You'd say, you've done this wrong picketing here, we're under the bill, we're going to sequester union funds. And then every union in the country, the railwaymen, the Transport General Workers Union would say, you know, this is Tory trade union legislation file, it's not a coal mine dispute any longer. And we're against Tory trade union legislation. And so, in my view, it wouldn't have had you know, the immediate desired result. As the strike continued into autumn, a threat of strike action by the Pitt Deputies Union NACODs set alarm bells ringing in government. They're the people who manage, do the managerial work in the mines, and very responsible and good union. And um, I, they were threatening to join in the strike. And it was important they didn't, because they were the people that uh, stopped a lot of the pits being flooded. And all the pits would have been flooded immediately if it wasn't for NACODs continuing the administration. The Coal Board had threatened to withhold pay from NACOD's members who refused to cross picket lines. The subsequent threat of strike action by the union in turn threatened a total shutdown of the pits, including those that had remained working. The government, including the Prime Minister, chose to distance itself from the Coal Board boss, Ian McGregor. Are you disappointed, Mr McGregor? That, uh, I'm always disappointed that, that our good people are uh, kept out on strike under what artificial conditions. I think there was friction between Ian McGregor and Nacolds. And I met with them, I spent hours with them, talking to them. And uh, they asked for certain things to be looked at in looking at pit closures. And I agreed with that. I agreed you know, that things and how it should be examined. And um, had they joined in the strike, it would have been very bad. Because, for example, the Nottinghamshire mines couldn't have continued working if Nacolds in Nottinghamshire had gone on strike. And so it was very important they didn't come in and support the strike, and they didn't. By November, the strike was beginning to collapse. The NCB had offered a bonus to returning miners, and the militants stepped up their attempts to stop them. Mrs Thatcher, though, had only praise for those defying Scargill's men. This year, as before in our history, we've seen men and women with brave hearts, defying violence, scorning intimidation, and defending their rights to uphold our laws. <laughs> By their action, we have seen a new birth of leadership in Britain. Mrs Thatcher was more confident of her position than ever. She could scent an impending victory of far more symbolic importance than normally ascribed to an industrial dispute. Now you talk about the ruthless, manipulating few. Now, will you not negotiate with them ever? I will never negotiate with people who use coercion and violence to achieve their objective. They are the enemies of democracy. They are not interested in the future of democracy. They are trying to kill democracy for their own purposes. With coal production increasing, the government announced at Christmas that there would be no power cuts. And as the new year started, even more miners went back to work. Support for Arthur Scargill was draining away as stories of Russian and Libyan money damaged his dwindling reputation, causing disillusion among other trade unionists and even his own members. When it was reported in the press that a lot of money was coming in from the Soviet Union, he said, yes, quite right, he said. It's collections taken by Soviet miners to support their English comrades. <laughs> and if you knew about the pay of Soviet miners, there was no money for them to give to collections. You know, but, um, um, and he used to go regularly to the Soviet embassy, was seen going to the Soviet embassy very regularly, talking to them. And now, you know, there's been published, at least Germany, the papers uh, from their government records of talks that Scargill had with them for financial support of his strike. <laughs> In the end, it was the miners themselves who voted with their feet gradually to return to work. Well, once they started going back in one pit, they tried going back in other pits and it spread. I mean, every day I had the figures for people going back to pits and where they were. And every day you had some new pits and you had more people going back into the pits that already started to go back.
and it built up a very rapid increasing momentum. And Scargill knew when that happened, yeah, he was finished. On the 3rd of March, 1985, a year after the strike began, at a special delegates conference, the NUM voted to return to work. Over the years, the NUM had negotiated better pay and better conditions and had done great work. And they stuck to this great principle of only striking with the ballot. And when that principle was broken, I think it did enormous damage to their union. And they lost their funds, they lost their clout. And uh, I think it did great damage to the union and great damage to the industry. I think they were a great union. And I'm very sorry that man did so much damage to it. In the end, I had to say to my own people in my own constituency, uh, as well as miners more widely, that they'd been misled, that they had been uh, the subject of falsified figures about uh, coal stocks, that their loyalty was being hideously exploited. And in the wake of the strike, to take the opportunity to explain all this very, very publicly indeed. And it would have been better for the peace of my soul, but certainly for the health of the Labour Party and the standing of the party, if I'd done those things as my instinct told me I should uh, in the early part of 1984. What Margaret Thatcher proved was that you could take on the National Union of Mine Workers and win. The NUM was regarded with a kind of uh, respect, I think, which didn't really belong to any other industrial union. Um, and uh, suddenly it was sort of made out to have been a paper tiger. It just collapsed. And of course now uh, the NUM barely exists. The miners' strike was not the only bloody industrial dispute of Mrs Thatcher's second term in office. The showdown between the print unions, first with Eddie Shah's newspaper group in Warrington and then with Rupert Murdoch's News International at Wapping, gave rise to further riots and violent confrontation. On this occasion, there was no direct involvement by government, but Mrs Thatcher's new employment legislation had tipped the balance in favour of the proprietors. Newspaper managements argue that old-fashioned union attitudes have made Fleet Street Labour relations a byword for hostility and conflict. Eddie Shah had caused outrage in 1983 when he decided to introduce new technology and get rid of the old print unions. We also have a, a, what is termed a no-strike clause, which really is pendulum arbitration. And I think the good thing about that is that the electricians realise that you can't always negotiate through conflict, which I think is which has been rife in this industry. It's there that you started to see some of the obduracy that um, started to mark the negotiating scene in the newspaper industry. There'd always been obviously there, an adversar adversarial approach, of course, um, but here you saw something a bit different. But worse was to come. You know, Rupert Murdoch did approach the unions. He was seeking a deal on flexible working, the end of the closed shop and a no-strike agreement. He knew, however, that the unions would never agree and had already done a deal with the Maverick Electricians Union, EETPU, to move all his papers from Fleet Street to Wapping. Murdoch, was, I think, was determined that if he was going to go in Wapping, he'd waited so long, he was going to go in under his terms. And his terms were unacceptable to our people. On the 24th of January, the workforce went out on strike. Rupert Murdoch sacked them all and within two days moved production to Wapping. In the preparation for the dispute, if he's nothing else, he's thorough. And his lawyers um, had been obviously asked about the legal implications uh, of such a dispute. And in the discussions, it was clear that, well, um, if they don't go to Wapping, you can sack them. These are the grounds, and this is how you do it. And all that was put in writing to Murdoch. And we were leaked a copy of that letter. And it was such a cynical demonstration of uh, industrial relations policy and how they were going to operate it that immediately got a lot of sympathy on our side. On day 12 of the dispute, Murdoch announced he was going to take the print union SOGAT 82 to court for continuing to black distribution of the Times and the Sun. At Wapping earlier, six legal pickets, again almost outnumbered by police, are managing to persuade almost no one to stop. Well, there's one or two that's gone away, but the um, majority of them are going in. 
Within the last hour, Mr Murdoch and his son editor showed off their papers, but what about getting them to read it? Uh, we got out nearly the full run of the Sunday Times. The delivery was spotty. We were late in London. We missed about 30% of the retailers in London. Uh, across the country, we got nearly everywhere. We didn't get to Norfolk. Uh, we didn't get to part of Southampton. Most places, Sunday Times, absolutely right. The news of the world, we only got 60% out, so there were bigger holes in the news of the world. It was the trigger for the start of a long and violent confrontation between Murdoch, the print unions, and the police. The strike lasted a year, ending in February 1987, with the print unions near bankruptcy and under threat of court proceedings. News International never lost a single night of production. Murdoch had broken the power wielded by the print unions over the newspaper industry. The union was weakened uh, in many respects. We lost our confidence, and I think that flowed through uh, with the Thatcher years, the Thatcher employment legislation, to the rest of the trade union movement too. Rupert did actually use all the legal weapons that she had made available. It enabled him to drive a coach and horses through the uh, print unions, who'd always been regarded as, you know, the absolute imperial guard of the trade unions. They were, I'm afraid, I have to say, fairly corrupt. Um, they were um, very much run on a principle of, uh, you know, father's job, son's job, this kind of thing. And uh, they never knew what hit them. And uh, she couldn't have done it without Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch couldn't have done it without her. The long battles involving the miners and the print unions dealt a severe blow to the union movement from which it would take years to recover. Mrs Thatcher had succeeded in her early election pledge to curb union power. It had come at a price, but she was victorious. Britain would never be the same. One does have to say that kind of breaking union power, irresponsible union power in this country, is one of her achievements. And um, it required even in a Tory party a strong prime minister to do that, particularly as we could look back and say, well, what happened to Ted Heath when he tried? And the answer was he lost the election and lost his job. So it did require guts and nerve and courage and all those qualities she certainly had. In the next programme, the Thatcher brand is unravelled, from the way she walked and talked to her prodigious energy and immaculate coiffure. You can order Margaret Thatcher, a tribute in words and pictures, for the special half-price fee of £10. Call Telegraph Books on 0870 155 7222 or order online at www.books.telegraph.co.uk.